Well, as I was telling Sharon, this is just a very uh, basic kind of biographical sketch we're doing today. Okay. Just talk to me. Don't worry about looking at Roger and the camera there. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Rolling? Mm -hmm. All right. I shouldn't even say rolling anymore. It's all going, these are all chip cameras now. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, thanks again for doing this. Um, let's begin kind of at the beginning. When, when did you first come to uh, Champaign-Urbana area? Uh, you were very young, I believe 16? Uh, yeah, Jack. Uh, I came in January 67, so uh, right to Champaign. And, you know, it was Welcome to America. I think that had the largest uh, snowfall a couple of days before I got here, I think 27 inches. So. Uh, and I'd never seen snow, obviously, coming from Pakistan. So it was uh, it was fascinating experience, obviously. What drew you here? Um, you know, I'd heard the streets were paved with gold, and the women were easy. And you know, I found out one out of those two is true: the streets are paved with gold. So, when did you first start working at uh, at Flex and Gate? Um, I started in August of seventy. Yeah, and right here, where we are, and you know, I've loved this place. Obviously, we're sitting here in a Quonset hut, which goes back uh, to 1945, and uh, just started here in August and did a lot of stuff, uh, working on the shop floor and uh, um, engineering design. Uh, then we went through a transition, um, got sold to a New York Stock Exchange company, worked for them. And then I left in '78. Uh, and when did you when did you attend U of I? Uh, from '67 to '70, '71. I finished my undergrad, and then I did graduate school in mechanical engineering. Really, a course at a time, more to learn, quite frankly, than to get a degree. So, how did that help lay the foundation for the career you've built since then? Uh, I think it's frankly fundamental. It's just about everything. Uh, uh, you, uh, the basics I learned. I mean, one thing in engineering school, it's still true today, uh, certainly at a school like Illinois, I mean, you're learning principles. You're not learning the practices. So uh, being in the area, being able to use the library, being able to talk to the people, it was, uh, uh, you know, basically uh, a great resource just to be here. You know. And I imagine at the same time, mm -hmm. what you're learning in the classroom, you're seeing it actually put into practice out on the floor, and you're seeing the actual engineering go to work. Absolutely. Uh, Could you describe that? Well, um, you know, and this is, it's almost like talking about historical times now, okay? So, uh, because, uh, which was the backbone, uh, the Industrial Revolution now, I think, uh, a lot of those practices, even teaching like foundry, machine shop, whatever, I mean, those are really fallen out of favor, so we don't see that. But for me, it was absolutely wonderful because I could come to work here, and then I did this for years. After work, I would go to the library, go through the journals, and find out what some of the uh, latest thinking was, even look at some of the magazines. Uh, trade journals uh, they would have. And so it's a great place to, st uh, to learn and also self-teach, yeah, so. What was Flex and Gate building when you came here? Um, was this was really a blacksmith shop. And it started off as um, basically a farmer who, in the winters, when uh, you couldn't work out in the fields, uh, outfit some trucks, and then customize uh, pickup trucks. You gotta remember, I mean, in the 1970s, pickup trucks were work, uh, uh, work vehicles. They weren't uh, uh, for uh, weekend cowboys, so to speak. So um, it's, uh, uh, so outfitting, customizing, there probably weren't two trucks that were fitted quite the same way, measuring and, uh, basically customizing. Um, you started your own company, uh, Bumper Works. Tell me about how that, how that took shape. Well, I had worked here for about uh, eight years, and uh, this was aftermarket, and uh, we were going through uh, the energy crisis. Uh, uh, there was first wave in 73 and then in 78, 
And uh, really my interest was uh, like lighter weight parts, weight translates into fuel efficiency. And uh, so I had some really ideas on uh, reducing weight and some revolutionary parts, which really there wasn't a need uh, in the aftermarket. So I left and uh, with SBA loan, uh, started basically a guy in a garage. Uh, doing a lighter weight part and then had customers, all Japanese for a long time, uh, who were bringing in smaller trucks from Japan and could see, uh, really could benefit from uh, stronger light parts. This probably would have been like the Datsuns and Nissans. Yeah, yeah. Uh, really the first customer I had was Isuzu, ah. and which was like Chevy Love. And it was quickly followed by Chrysler, which was going through some of its challenges, then importing a Mitsubishi truck. And then our business evolved where at one time we were doing bumpers for every Japanese truck that came in, Mazda, Mitsubishi, uh, obviously Nissan or Datsun in those days. Yeah, so. It was a, a seamless bumper design? Yeah. Uh, drawn is a, I, think I'm, I hope I'm using the right terminology for Yeah, it. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, in those days, uh, you know, you fabricated a part from half a dozen different pieces of steel. You weld them, ground them, and uh, uh, this was uh, out of one continuous piece of metal. Uh, and uh, so the shapes were better, more aerodynamic, but more importantly, didn't have the labor, some of the corrosion issues. Yeah, so. Um, you came back and you bought Flexengate not too much longer, or not too, not too long after that. Yeah, so I came back in a couple of years. Uh, this was then part of uh, Scott & Fetzer, which was a New York Stock Exchange company, and it really got sold to Warren Buffett, of all people. A uh, very small part, obviously, and they wanted to divest themselves of really this area. So, and we needed capacity, so I was able to come back and buy them. How big was the factory in those days? Uh, I think um, in 1980, when I came back, they were doing about three million a year yeah, in sales. So I mean, very small. Yeah, I think about 30, 40 people. Yeah. How did the how did the product line start to diversify? You you moved from bumpers into everything from chassis to plastic interiors to trim. Uh, just about everything that goes into the car industry. Yeah, uh, Jack, I mean, for us really, um, you know, it was uh, focus. We had one product line in those days, which was just bumpers, and we wanted to be the best at it. Um, there was really, uh, you know, I used to keep a list of like 18 competitors in my briefcase all the time. See, you know, you get up in the morning, you see what each one of them might be doing that day. And it's interesting, you know, every one of them uh, got out of business. Either it was sold or consolidated or bankrupt or whatever. So, um, and then, you know, we thought we were doing real well because you could pick up that business. But then uh, uh, this is about evolution, about automotive uh, revolution. So our product line, which was steel, uh, changed to plastic. And really, uh, there is nothing in common other than there might be bumper systems. So we had to really evolve very quickly or we weren't going to have any business. Um, you started uh, supplying bumpers to the big three automakers in 1984? Yeah, about there uh, really after that. And then, you know, it takes a while to get traction. This is uh, really, this is a very evolutionary business, very conservative business. So uh, you have to prove yourself and then uh, you're able to, uh, uh, you know, obviously reap the rewards later on. So, um, but uh, about that same time we went through, this would be like early 90s, uh, Toyota was really our key customer in those days, and they were looking as to what it takes, uh, what made them successful in Japan, what would make them successful overseas. And we became the first company outside Japan that got help from them on lean thinking and lean manufacturing. So that was really a foundation, a core uh, principle, um, the core uh, competency that you know we acquired. 
remember when Mitsubishi started in, in Normal a few mm -hmm. years ago, how yeah. we, we did a tour of it with, uh, I was with the Illinois News Broadcasters yeah. Association mm -hmm. then, and they were talking about a concept that was then new to the American car industry, mm -hmm. which was you, you, you bring the stuff in only as it's needed. Yeah. And there's not this big backlog of stock parts laying around yeah. it. it and that's what they call lead manufacturing? Yeah, lead manufacturing, just in time. Basically, the whole thinking is, uh, you know, it's pull the customer, demand pulls the product versus uh, manufacturing efficiencies that might push the product. Yeah, so. How did, how did your company evolve along with that, with that principle? Well, it's, um, obviously, it's the right principle. Yeah, you have to evolve if you're going to be competitive cost-wise, quality-wise. You have to adopt those latest uh, uh, technologies, latest thinking, or you know, you're going to be obsolete. So, Coming into the industry from, as you say, when this mm -hmm. was basically kind of a blacksmith shop mm -hmm. when you started, you, you've seen revolutions in the way that things are done, things are designed mm -hmm. with computer-assisted design and now with manufacturing. How has that changed? How has the business evolved over the last 40 years that you've been involved in? Yeah, there's very little, obviously, that's similar, uh, frankly. I think uh, uh, time is uh, vital. I mean, you have to be very quick. Um, there's a huge amount of engagement you don't have uh, by everybody, whether it's a uh, uh, person on the shop floor or uh, somebody designing. There's a huge amount of continuity, flexibility, agility is what you need, and uh, an open thinking. I mean, customers are changing, products are changing, and if you, you have to be able to roll with the punches very quickly. So, And the consumer's getting pretty demanding. Too, yeah, very demanding. Because the cost of cars and trucks is such now that it's a major investment that you want to get the most out of your money. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, uh, well, it's second largest uh, investment, I think, after a house person's going to, uh, you know, a rich person is going to spend. But I think if you look at it, by far the cars are more durable and trucks than they've ever been. Uh, downside of that is the oldest fleet on the road today in the history since invention of the automobile is right now. Average car is about 10 years old. Uh, it's because, and you know, if you think about it, it's when is the last time you saw a car, the uh, you know, floorboard was rusted out or fenders were rusted out. You don't see that. Uh, in the winter, obviously, your cars start. Uh, you take a lot more for granted. So the quality, the durability, um, and the emotional appeal has to be there. Uh, I think we see some of the more traditional Japanese who did very well. I mean, you know, talking to a, a cord lover here. Um, they are losing some of the appeal because they don't have uh, the emotional appeal, the design, uh, and uh, some of the essence, really, some of the creature comforts. So there is a renaissance, obviously, for the Koreans and uh, the Americans right now to be able to take advantage of those gaps. So you, that's a great example. Some of the best-selling cars of yesteryear today don't do that well today. So, How did the company grow to an international to, to, pro, to a, a company that's in Mexico, in mm -hmm. Spain, mm -hmm. South America, yeah. Canada? Yeah. Um, for us, it was that, um, you know, you, in this business, if you are standing still, you're falling behind. You, so you have to evolve, you have to grow. And uh, really, it's a key learning for me that uh, uh, it doesn't really matter what the economy is or how many vehicles are being sold. As a company, you have to grow. It challenges the people, and more importantly, I mean, you uh, create a DNA structure, which is always evolving for the better. So uh, we can, uh, you know, when you end up with a very high uh, penetration of the product line you have, then you have to grow outside that. So for us, we had to kind of leave the comfort or the security area of central Illinois, central Indiana, and move beyond that. Uh, be able to find uh, not only product line facilities and also really people, talent, uh, which uh, could mesh in with some of our core principles. You started to mm -hmm. touch upon some of those. Mm -hmm. what, what, is, what is your business philosophy? What are the values that this company represents not only to its customers but to the people who work here? Yeah. 
Well, I think first of all, it starts with the customer. You got to meet their needs, and I, once you meet the needs, then uh, which is you got to have the right product for the right price on time to the quality they're expecting. That's so simple, but so hard. Um, once you go beyond that, you got to have the right people, and um, I mean our evolution that you know till 1990, uh, you know we were about a 15 million dollar a year company. And then uh, the next uh, 10 years, we became maybe about 150 to 200 million, had about a tenfold increase, and now we're over 3 billion a year. So this is with the ups and downs uh, of the marketplace. I mean, we've been able to sustain it. So I mean, the core principle is you gotta find the right people. Uh, and they have to have the right resources, they have to be treated uh, properly where they can contribute in a meaningful way. So it's about making money, but it's also really changing people's lives. Well, I, I've read some of the reviews from employees of yours, mm -hmm. and they're very good. The company takes feedback seriously. They help people mm -hmm. advance up the corporate ladder. Mm -hmm. uh, you, get, you get good marks from the folks who work. With, with yeah, I, I think we get good marks, and I think uh, you know we also get, and we welcome, frankly, constructive criticism. And God knows I get plenty of that, too. Okay, so, and uh, you know that makes us better. So, I mean, we're far from perfect, and I think, uh, a uh, lot of room for improvement, but um, you know you have an open mind and uh, you can grow. And doing a little digging into mm -hmm. uh, into the company, uh, you have a set of social principles that you you live by. You have environmental principles. Mm -hmm. um, I did a little reading into that. Uh, the company wants to be very socially aware. You subscribe to the Sullivan principles mm -hmm. on, on human rights. Um, and as an international company, that's something that I think speaks very well of you. Yeah, I think you have to do that, and um, you want to be part of the community. Um, so, in some areas, Mexico is a great example that uh, uh, you know some of our processes, whether it's paint, whether it's chrome plating, um, you know, we use the water in Mexico, and then when we get done with it, uh, you know, we are also the sewer system or the for the community where. We put the water out in the farm fields where they can reuse it with a shortage. So um, it's uh, you have to be very, very aware of why and uh, you go much really beyond what the limits might be on environmentally. So uh, some of the communities, I mean, the resources we're using are very precious to them, and um, so. I think awareness, it's just good business, quite frankly. It, it took me a long time to figure out that, uh, and I think American industry as a whole, that you know, quality saved money and made the companies better. And it, it wasn't something you know, that was costing money. Once you kind of understand that it's good business, uh, then you can take advantage of really some of the core principles. Um, which leads me to mm -hmm. your uh, philanthropy. You, You've taken a great interest in giving back to the University of Illinois here in the Champaign-Urbana area. Um, obviously, you know, on the, uh, in the Business Advisory Council, mm -hmm. College of Commerce, College mm -hmm. of Engineering Board of Visitors, uh, you're very interested in the success of this place. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, we've lived here for a long time. And I think the university is going through, will go through a change. I think it's been well supported by the state state of Illinois, but I think that's a changing model. I mean, they have to evolve to a more private and a public partnership. And, you know, we've done our part. So, and I think not only the university, that's just one element. Uh, I mean, we've uh, been active with the libraries, uh, you know, with a women's shelter. I mean, a lot of other social and civic causes, not only here, but really some of the other areas. And again, it's, you know, it's part of being, uh, uh, part of the social fabric of the community and then really playing a positive role. So, Well, I, I see that you're, you're very interested in the applied health sciences uh, area at, at uh, U of I, uh, Center for Health, Aging, and Disability. Mm -hmm. You've endowed professorships there. That's kind of a different area for, for someone who has an engineering background. What, what draws you to that? Uh, my wife. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, this was really her passion, and uh, you know, so uh, she really has been the key driver for that, quite frankly. So, uh, and um, uh, 
and it's, it's something, frankly, all of us are going to benefit from uh, moving forward, and it's an area that needed help um, at the university. It wasn't the most sexiest of the areas, and um, so really she's been the key driver. Well, it's an area, though, where you can mm -hmm. really change lives. You can really do something. There. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we're getting to the, uh, to the end of uh, the questions, but what, what still, you know, for someone who's done so much in so many different areas, what, mm -hmm. what still excites you in the morning when you get up to, to uh, what's, where are the new ideas coming from? Where do you want to go mm -hmm. next? Well, I think, uh, you know, I mean, what excites me is uh, you're part of a, I mean, this is one thing you learn, this is the greatest country on planet Earth. Uh, and uh, no matter what you might hear on TV, uh, especially if you go overseas, uh, first question that comes up, hey, how can I get to the U.S.? So um, it is, um, uh, you know, I, it absolutely is a very, very, you know, exciting uh, time, certainly for us. And, um, uh, you know, the automobile, I mean, I've loved cars. Uh, ever since I can remember, and I mean, just to be part of that is really fascinating. Uh, see the new technologies that are emerging, the role we can play, and uh, you know, you get up, you want to make a difference. I think in customers and people's life, and really grow the business. And today, I mean, we got all the resources. I mean, we have a track record, we have credibility, we got money, we got great people. So uh, it's like the fun is just beginning. Yeah. So. I meant to ask you this at yeah. the beginning. Were, were you always, as a kid, into cars? Were you always into? Uh... Yeah, I, I've loved cars and um, uh, for a long time. <laughs> and it's I never thought that you know you would uh, be able to make a living, frankly, you know, in cars. But uh, and you know when you just fall into something you like. I mean, I love I love love machinery. Uh, many, many clocks and you know other mechanical things I took apart as a kid that I never put back together or was never able to put back together. So there are a lot of clocks that weren't working when I found them, and they were, yeah, you know, worse off when I got done with them. But um, so um, the you know the mechanical aspect has really uh, I've loved from a kid to today. I mean, so. Uh, it's interesting you say yeah. that my dad was a watchmaker. Yeah. So I grew up around clocks and yeah. watches of yeah. all sizes, you know. Yeah. Uh, even the little ladies' watches about the size of your fingertip, you know, they could work on those things. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Probably has his, had his eyeglass and, uh, you know, pliers and all the little tools, you know, yeah. the jeweler's tools. Jeweler's you know. tools, yeah. uh, dentist tools, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, so. um, what, what at this point? In life, as you look back, what, what gives you the most satisfaction over what you've been able to, to do so far? I think uh, probably, you know, satisfaction, you know, is uh, certainly I've had a great life. I think the, um, the absolute coincidence of ending, ending up in central Illinois at 16, you know, I think it's probably the most fortunate thing that happened to me. But I think beyond that, being able to make a difference in people's lives, you know, as you find the resources and uh, to be able to, uh, you know, obviously have great family and, uh, you know, not really uh, get burdened with, uh, you know, some of the daily headaches, frankly. What did you think when uh, you, you learned that you had been named the laureate of the Lincoln Academy? <laughs> I mean, I was shocked. <laughs> I had no idea, you know, uh, something like that. It's obviously, you know, it's a great privilege. Sean, is there anything I haven't touched on? No. I think we're actually in very good shape. Okay, well, I mean, you did your homework, and uh, obviously you know more about our company than I did. So, uh, <laughs> so it's, fab you know, it's fabulous. So, so PBS is working, working hard, yeah. Yeah, well, we're, yeah. we're trying. We're yeah. trying. It's, uh, <laughs> this, is a, this, is a, this is a fun program. To yeah. I mean, we've been everywhere from, like, the Argonne National Laboratory, yeah. the biggest art museums, everything is yeah. because of this program, and it's just been fascinating over yeah. the years. Yeah, wonderful. Um, I think we're done with this. Absolutely. Part of it. Um, so we